Yeah, thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. It's the first time uh, I'm in Istanbul, and I haven't seen much of the city. Uh, I will not see much of the city, but <laughs> I think you have a very nice campus here, and really happy to be here and to talk a little bit about my, um, my research uh, with you. So um, I'm working in the field of interaction design, psychology. I'm a psychologist by training, and uh, I was always interested in combining somehow uh, research on well-being with uh, uh, research on design or with the practice on designing uh, for, for uh, technologies. And um, what came out of this, first it was experience design or user experience was the first step. Now it's a little bit even more about well-being and maybe even even going so far and talking about designing well-being through technology. And through the talk, I'd like to show you a little bit um, model-wise what that means, how can you approach that, what would be uh, psychological concepts helpful for designers. And of course, I'd like to show you a lot of examples of what that could actually mean if you try to design for well-being. Not always perfect examples, but you know, it's research. We have to try out many different things. But let's start with the beginning. So mm, what is well-being? I mean, there are many uh, different definitions of, of well-being. Most of them agree that it's about a sense of life satisfaction, but also about having positive moments throughout the day. So we're living our lives, and things happen. And you know, when these things are positive, they add to our well-being. Now, we all, now, now, as we are in the room, we are all a little bit different in terms of our happiness levels, I'd say. And there are many, many reasons for this, um, because happiness has actually different sources. But one uh, that is very particular, interesting for a designer is, uh, are the activities. So um, it's about the things we do in everyday life that give us the chance you know, to have positive experiences or not. Um, you could say um, that um, these activities determine happiness, at least uh, to, uh, to some extent. And of course, because while we can decide about what to do, choose our activities, we also choose a little bit um, about how we can become happy or unhappy. I mean, um, it's quite nice to know that, but of course, uh, if you want to design for something like this, you have to go deeper. So we need to know something about the mechanisms that determine whether an activity is positive or experience is positive or not. And um, there are not that many, um, many theories around there, but uh, most of them feature something um, called needs or psychological needs. Um, you have to satisfy, and, or when they're satisfied throughout a, an activity, you get this feeling of meaning and, and positive experience. In self-determination theory, for example, which I use a lot or ex in an extended version, there's one particular need that's very important. It's called autonomy. So the idea is that if you can do things the way you want to do them, if an activity is structured in a way that it allows you to do the things the way you want to do them, then you have the chance of experiencing autonomy, and that can be positive. That can be a positive moment. I took the example here of, I like to bake cake, and of course you always have a recipe for that, but when you're a little bit more advanced, you can toy around with it, and sometimes, you know, I go just like, I don't care about the recipe, and this gives me uh, a good feeling of doing it the way I want to do, like the Hassan Salt style of baking a cake, and not what the recipe uh, uh, tells me. So this would be, for example, this would be an example for an autonomy experience. Um, a little bit about these needs, I mean, uh, Ryan Dickey, they understand them as, as basic, as universal. It's a state that is, when it's satisfied, is uh, um, connected to, uh, to well-being, and um, it's um, essential to satisfy these needs throughout the, uh, throughout the day or throughout your lives. So, um, I mean, if you distill the most important things from that, um, it's important to understand that need fulfillment is related to well-being. It's maybe the explanatory um, concept for well-being. Um, and um, it's also a not motivation. So they pull things that satisfy our needs. We want to do them again and we want to repeat them or mo engage more in them. And um, the interest, one interesting thing that is the idea that these needs are innate. So we all share them. 
It's not that uh, uh, you have other needs than I. So they're basic human uh, nutriment, so to say. So let's go through the list of needs we could work with because, of course, for design, it would be important to distinguish a little bit between different needs and see whether they work different and whether we need to design for them a little bit different. So we had already autonomy. Competence is also a very important need. Mm, um, we all want to be good at things we do. And um, when we engage in activities that provide this feeling of mastery, then we uh, experience competence. I picked uh, this. I'm not the mountain climbing guy, actually, but uh, I think it's a good example of um, what a meaningful experience is. Mm, typically, at the beginning of user experience design, Many people thought it was often about fun, you know, fun and pleasure, and this idea was that, you know, everything is positive all the time. This is already the first example when you design for competence that it is uh, not that easy. I mean, I don't know whether one of you ever climbed a mountain. I suspect it's not always positive, not throughout the time. Maybe you're cold, maybe the feet hurt. I mean, there are many negative uh, moments in that, but when you made it on top of that um, uh, summit, then, of course, you experience uh, competence. So most of these experiences are not positive throughout the, uh, the whole time. They are mixed experiences, and that's what, what real life is about. And if you do studies with this, um, and people, uh, you ask people about positive experience they have in life, uh, and, they, uh, and let's say need is the major, uh, um, competence is the major need in that, you will always find that they have positive feelings, and also a lot of negative feelings in this, uh, in this, um, in these experiences. Um, the next uh, uh, need is relatedness. So we are social animals. We want to be together with other uh, people, family, uh, the closest intimate partners, but also extended uh, social circles. And um, of course, we can also design, or we have a lot of technologies that care about feeling close to each other. These are the three basic uh, needs um, that um, self-determination theory uses. Uh, we always add some uh, because there are some things which are not really covered by that. One is, of course, stimulation. We like new things. We like to be curious. We like a little bit of mystery, um, explore, stuff like that. There's something like popularity. Uh, so sometimes, uh, we like to be accepted, uh, especially accepted for something we did by other people. Um, for example, um, I mean, often this is about status, and uh, uh, we do a lot of research in uh, pro-social behavior, so when do people help others, and how can interaction design help along with that? That would be an example of a popularity ex uh, experience, if you help somebody along and you get something back for that. We, are, we have a body, so physical striving is also important. Um, the whole research on activity trackers, or why, why people use activity trackers, uh, activity trackers are often at the first glance motivated by becoming more healthy, uh, but also other um, phenomena like um, um, other kinds of self-improvement, you know, even a hairdress, even if you get a hairdress, it's, it's about you know, feeling good in your body and feeling safe. Uh, and uh, accept yourself there. And the last um, need we work with is security. Um, this is sometimes a bit difficult because um, often then people think of it as, as in terms of being safe and secure, um, having a house, having money, having food, stuff like that. I mean, of course, this is a, an important, um, um, important thing here as well, but um, here it's more about having rituals and being in an environment that is familiar. So I picked um, this scene, for example, because it's my typical, typically the way I get up in the morning. So I'm the first in the family. I go and grab the uh, coffee maker exactly as it is depicted here. And this five minutes, this 10 minutes is like a ritual for me to get into the day. And of course, at the end of it, I get a nice coffee as well. But that, that's not the whole story. If you would have, if you would give me an automated, fully automated, coffee maker, uh, it wouldn't do the trick. I would have coffee, but I wouldn't have that feeling of the ritual to come into, into the day. So um, in many cases, um, this is also a very interesting uh, need to work with, I would say. 
it's all a bit theoretically, I know, you know, have these needs, and then, I mean, when you think about it now, and you just try to think about a positive experience you had last week, the, the idea is that some of these needs will show up in that experience. You can explain uh, this positivity through uh, some of these needs. But still, I want to, I would like to show you one of these needs in action. We're doing some research also for uh, car manufacturers. Um, this movie, I'll show you a little movie. This is unfortunately, it's in, in German, but it's subtitled. And I want you to just try, try to figure out what need uh, the person is talking about. I hope that works. Macht Parken Spaß? Für mich macht Parken Spaß, ja. Was macht dir denn am Parken Spaß? Weil es so eine, wie so ein Geschicklichkeitsspiel ist. Es hat sowas mit räumlichem Denken, äh, Orientierung, Schwung, bleib, keine Ahnung, es ist wie so eine kleine, es wie so eine kleine Minisportart, so, für mich. Wie so ein Geschicklichkeitsspiel tatsächlich. Also irgendwas, an was man sich auch so, mit, mit dem man sich so messen kann. So who like to park the car? Is somebody here a specialist in the room? Nobody, everybody hates it? Really? Typically two or three or five people secretly then at a certain moment? No. <laughs> this guy, he loves parking the car. And what is the need he satisfies with it? Competence. It's all about the skill and the challenge and like a mini sport art. Um, it's important um, to understand with this example that, um, of course, you know, nobody invented parking so that he has a good time. <laughs> I mean, it comes from the necessity of everyday life. But on the other hand, it's a very good example how, how humans can um, reap, I would say, or get meaning out of their everyday activities if the activity allows for it. So this car, the car, the car, the lot, the parking activity allows for him to experience competence. And of course, there are many, if, if, they, try, if, if they do market research, uh, many people say, I hate parking. If you would have a parking robot, then let's do it. And then you do it. But on the other hand, if you ask positively about it, so what do you enjoy in or around your car, you also get something like this. So for me, that's an important lesson, you know, to, to to understand that um, if, you, if it's about positive moments, um, um, you're not supposed to ask about problems all the time. There will always also be people that enjoy many, many situations, other will find a problem, and we can design for that in a certain way, or we should. So now, that this, this was like a little introduction into psychology, but of course, um, the needs, they don't help much. I mean, they give you a little bit orientation. You can explain later on uh, stuff with it, but there are only six, seven needs, and of course you can't explain every phenomenon that is on the world, everything people do, every technology you have, every domain through this. So um, while these needs are universal and we all share them, we all have quite different ways of fulfilling them. So I would say the activities or the practices are different, and that's actually what design is interested in. So by establishing new practices or by the way people do stuff, um, the, the, the everyday is structured and it can be structured in a way that is more positive or not so positive, that's the idea. And of course, things, um, technology is key to that. So every activity we do involves technology. There's virtually no activity, uh, only if very few that are not uh, using any type of designed artifacts uh, to be uh, carried out. So in, in, uh, in, the, sci in the philosophy of technology, um, it's, it's quite clear that um, there it's not, you know, not the things world and the human world, but it's just one. And we wouldn't be humans without our things, and our things um, exert a certain power um, um, over us. And uh, typically, we shouldn't really divide that. We should understand ourselves as, 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 as these things, as extended, ex extended selves, so to say. But typically, um, the common view is rather that things are instruments, tools, and that they're not really, that we choose to use them, and that they don't really, I don't know, structure our life that much. I mean, some, now and then we recognize that it's not like this, but 
the idea is rather, you know, there are things, people want them, and they do with that whatever they want, and, uh, and the object is rather neutral. But it's not the case. I mean, let me show you the same scene, the same guy, using a, a different technology for parking we already talked about, and just see how he reacts. Und wie fühlt sich das jetzt an? Voll gruselig. <lacht> Wenn du jetzt an dieses, was du vorher gesagt hast, was du schön findest am Parken, was hat ja, das, das davon? Nicht, am, äh, nicht im Ansatz so befriedigend. Es ist irgendwie beeindruckend, dass er das hinkriegt. Ne? Also dass er jetzt auch wahrscheinlich mhm. ziemlich gut an der, am Rand und so, äh, der parkt halt perfekt ein. Ne? Muss man ihm schon lassen. Ja, ich sehe nicht mehr hin. Mhm. Und so, und, ähm, aber irgendwie ist es nicht so eine große Befriedigung. Wenn ich, jetzt nur, wenn ich jetzt selber eingeparkt hätte. Und ich parke halt aber ja, wer, 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 wer hat denn jetzt hier gerade gut geparkt? Das Auto, das System hat gut geparkt. Ja, ich habe damit nichts zu tun. In dem mhm. Fall. So, quite typical. Yeah? The automation takes away the experience. Now it's gone. Um, he has nothing to do with it. He, he, he starts to stand outside of that. He, he watches the system do it. Um, and of course, I mean, uh, his, his life will not be mm, that much worse through this, but you know, from my perspective, there's just one moment he could have throughout the day that would have, you know, that would have made him happy is gone. And I think it's even worse a little bit because um, the engineers, they did it in a way that the car is even better than him. I, uh, in, if you follow the whole German through, he says like, you know, he's, he's looking, they have, you have a criteria for good parking, you know, it's like this, how straight and close you are to the, to the curb. And he's looking at it and the car is doing it perfectly and he envies it a little bit. So it, it's not, it's not ju just that it takes away, it also devalues his own uh, skills. And I think that there are, if you know all this, I think there would be ways to design this kind of a system, system in a way that keeps the feeling of competence maybe intact, or at least tries to, would try to reconcile the automation with the experience. So just this, this as an example, this is the, the basic story of, I think, of experience design in a way. So we, we want to design for positive emotions, we have these needs, and then we have particular practices and situations that have to be structured, and technology takes a very big role in, in telling us how situations are and also you know, telling us how to feel maybe. And I would like to give you, um, go through one example, um, the current example of activity trackers, just to, 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 to show you the stories that are embedded in that and we often don't question that stories. So um, I'm interested in behavioral change and uh, of course I have a Fitbit, I, have, I use Endomondo for running, I have a Night Plus and um, and this is how the dashboard looks at Endomondo when you do a run. And you see a lot of numbers and curves and details about, you know, the, it's just the data, of course, that the, the smartphone uh, takes up. Uh, so it's basically about data and information and that's somehow visualized. Sometimes it's also a little bit about motivation. So my Nike Plus is doing this. And now and then you get a silly reward. So I run on Halloween and then I get a, 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 I get a candy. So that's the state of the technology as it is. So what is the story of that? So what, what kind of stories are conveyed through this? And I think it's quite, it's quite a distinct one. So first of all, for example, exercise is medicine. It's nothing you do just to feel good. It's something you have to do to stay healthy. It is like a duty, and the, the whole machine is reflecting upon that. You know, it's, it's telling you um, here, uh, it's something you have to do, and I will help you with this. It's nothing to be enjoyed on its own. And uh, performance is fun. So it's all about measuring, about getting faster, burn more calories, about improving, because that's the only thing you can do <laughs> with this kind of data you have. Uh, you become something like, I would say, like an accountant of yourself. So uh, you count workouts, you count kilometers, uh, you, I don't know, you want to increase step counts, stuff like that. You're not thinking about running as an activity good for the body, but as something that satisfies numbers. And, you know, it's not so diff different, uh, the, the chart of Endomon is not so different from 
being encountered in a, I don't know, controlling your stock portfolio or something like that. It's all the same metaphor, metaphor with that. Uh, and if you do so anything social in that context, it's all about competing. So you always compare, you, uh, the only fun comes from, from being better than others, comparing, um, comparing yourself with friends or so. Only a very few do anything to cooperatives. Normally it's, they take this sports idea and then you're uh, competing. Which is silly, you know, because it means, um, I mean, there are always a lot of losers <laughs> in this kind of, of game. So it might be motivating when you're first, but it's maybe not so motivating if you're not, if you're the one that is uh, second or so. So it's, it's a bit questionable. This kind of notion that is incorporated, uh, de designed into, whether, in whether by intention or not, I would rather suspect not, but which is designed into the technology, of course, leads to certain practices, ways people do sports. Um, and there's a, there's a very nice paper by Fritz et al, and they uh, collected examples of what people do with trackers in the real, in the, the real life, and I'd just good, like to, to read that. So, and you, you have to depict that in your mind, okay? This is the scene that is described here. So the guy was saying, I was, uh, uh, I think, at 17 flights. So the Fitbit is also counting flights when you go stairs. And I thought, oh, I could get to 25. I just started walking up and down the steps while I was reading my Kindle. After I hit 100 floors, I decided, OK, probably ought to cool down now because it was 11 at night. And I just walked at the slower pace while I was reading for the next hour. I mean, imagine that situation. There's this guy in your stairwell. In your in the in the house, just you know, reading the Kindle, and and doing steps. I don't know whether this is really um, an idea, the, the best idea of uh, doing sports, or doing or looking at something like this. Um, people go to places where they use a machine to, uh, as efficient as possible, to uh, fill up their health or do their health duties. Is also an expression of a certain idea about what sports is, which is all in, built into that technology. Um, and of course, there are some studies showing that there are um, hidden costs of all this. So there's a very nice study by Etkin, and he did many different things. But in one study, for example, he, asked, he gave people uh, in the morning, he gave them an activity tracker, an, a, a pedometer and step counter. And half of the people were told that, uh, look, this is a step counter, it counts steps, and it's about making you more active and you should walk more about uh, the day, try it out. And the other got the tracker in a, in, a, um, in a case and they were told it's all about the comfort of carrying that case. So they were not told that, uh, they were not hinted at uh, that this measures anything. It was just, you know, they, it was the, at the evening they were asked about the comfort of wearing that case. In the evening, they came back to the lab, and then, um, of course, you could read out the steps, and the guys that were told that this is all about counting steps, of course, they had significantly more steps. But they also had a uh, some questionnaires, and among that questionnaires was, was the question, uh, how much, two questions, how much they like walking in general. And there you had the reverse effect, that the people that, uh, did the, the many steps through the pedometer, thought that walking is less fun. And uh, the um, interpretation was that, and uh, that was shown in many other studies, in, in, in seven other studies in that paper, is that through this counting and through the goals and all that representation of numbers, um, walking became a little bit like work, so externally motivated and lost a little bit of its appeal. And nobody knows what the long-term consequences of, of uh, this is. And again, this is an effect of, um, of the way this activity tracker is designed. It's not a, a basic human um, feature that works like this. So what would be alternatives? And there aren't that many, actually. So one that is quite known, uh, maybe you know it's Zombies Run. Do you know that? Who knows Zombies Run? Who tried it out? Okay, so in Zombies Run, it's about five kilometers runs, and they're wrapped into a story. Basically, it's about a zombie apocalypse, and now and then um, you meet hordes of zombies, and they, run, they chase you, and then you run a little bit faster, 
And let's say the whole run is covered into such a story. It has, it has good points, I tried it out. It has nice points, I mean this um, running is very deeply connected to the zombie archetype. I mean, who's, when somebody's in zombie movies, no running is essential to it, so it somehow fits. Other things uh, don't work that well, but not, that's not necessarily the point here. Um, I would like to, just to point out that um, it tells a complete different story. So now running is, um, you run for your life, it's a survival technique, you know, it's something you needed to scavenge food, even if it's just a fantasy. Yeah? You're, it's a complete different story. Um, you enjoy status through running and you're somehow prepared. And again, when you're in um, zombie movies, you know how important that is. I don't know Rule whether you... Rule one for surviving zombie land? Pardon me. Rule one. When the virus struck, for obvious reasons, the first ones to go were the fatties. <laughs> So, this is a different story. You, might, you won't li like it, maybe, but it's about reframing all this. This is a project a student of mine did. It's called Kuro. Um, I don't want to go into the detail of the apps, but this is also a running app uh, with a s kind of story. This is about you, you become the, um, um, an apprentice of Hermes, the god messenger. And we, through this, we tap into, uh, try to tap into the Greek culture of physical exercise, uh, which is also a complete different. Here, you, it's about running in style. It's about running as a useful activity, and it's about you know, so integrity of, of uh, body and, and mind. Um, I have a quote here from, from an exercising person um, where he says about the Greek, classical Greek culture that exercise was not, was not just a dull duty. And uh, let's just take the last uh, sentence. Uh, they kept sprinting, wrestling, and throwing their javelins, not just because of war health, but because it polished their souls and exercise offered virtues and pleasures alongside hard bodies. So it's again a different story. And um, I think um, with this example, I'd like to show that um, the technology itself matters. Design is sometimes like styling this thing, so you, you get, so you get a, uh, the contract to make this, um, make this uh, activity tracker better, and then you start to make a nicer wristband and uh, have a sleek design. But in fact, what it is about is about the conceptual ideas, the conceptual underpinnings, the, the stories that are told through this technology. So uh, before I go into some examples, some more examples, let's just me wrap that up into a model very quick because I now have these different uh, concepts and I like to connect them. So we have well-being as a goal. Uh, we will reach it through positive experiences and um, these experiences happen when we fulfill needs. We have different practices to do that and interaction and things are essential to that. They shape the practices to a good extent. So it's all about um, connecting meaning and material, and this also are the two areas we design for. So when you think that design is very much about the material, of course it's not. It's also about the meaning, and we have to design both in, 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 in a way that it fits together uh, or expresses it, uh, itself. So um, let me just give you some examples from my research. Um, like details uh, where we can discuss a little bit um, whether this all works or it's just a nice theory or just a nice model. Um, so one study we did, for example, in a kitchen was we compared two ways of preparing um, coffee. Uh, the one was like just, we, we just, you know, had the setup. We asked people, you know, just make yourself a cup of coffee. Uh, we had the hand grinder. We had this little espresso machine and they had to use that all. And of course, you can see it's not always convenient, always a bit complicated. Maybe you have uh, this cooker, which can become hot, or you have all kinds of usability problems. But of course, at the end, you have a nice uh, cup of coffee. And we asked them to compare it with preparing coffee with this, with the Sensei Opet uh, coffee machine. You know, both produce, produce coffee. Um, it's just you know, interesting how the technology shapes the different experiences. 
So we let them prepare the coffee and then we used different questionnaires. We asked, um, we used, we have a questionnaire to measure needs. We measured positive affect. Uh, we also asked them about the most positive moment and the most negative moment. And just to check, check out whether really, you know, whether we can measure differences in experience that come about through these different ways of doing things. And of course it works. Um, these are the different needs I've also talked about and the yellow stuff is where it is statistically significant, the difference. So when you, when you prepare the coffee more manually, you have more need fulfillment because you experience more competence and more stimulation. Of course, competence through all the uh, manual things you have to do, stimulation through being closer to the coffee, to the hot water and stuff like this. But also we have, of course, more effects. Um, uh, doing it ma more manually was more positive, effectively, but also more negative. So it's not that it's better in that sense. It's uh, more intense, I would say. Um, it took ages, much, more, much longer, of course, uh, doing it uh, manually. 11 minutes in, on average and three minutes with the sensor pad machine. And if you look at the positive moments and negative moments, it's interesting because in the positive moments, for the people that do the manual things, the positive moments were all in the process of doing it. For the others, of course, it was all about the coffee. So it, it, um, it let people focus either on the results, on the outcome of the whole process, or on the process it, itself. And with the negative, it, in, for the manual, there are many problems in this kind of uh, activity, of course, and there are negative moments. Uh, and for the guys doing, using the machine, um, the, the only negative moment was the waiting time, because of course we forced them to sit there and wait <laughs> until the machine is ready, and suddenly three minutes became very, very long. So if you take that together, um, you could say that the experience, through using the machine, the experience becomes flat, less meaningful, um, less, less enjoyable, but of course also less demanding and, uh, and um, more convenient. So it's not something, you know, it's not like you, we should ever do everything like this. We need to find ways to reconcile that a little bit because we have, you can have two perspectives on that. You can have convenience perspective now and say, yeah, it's exactly what I want. I want a fast, a cup of coffee, and that's what the machine is doing, and then I have time. Now I have time for other things. Or you can uh, take it again from a well-being persp perspective and say, okay, through the machine, I lose another opportunity to feel competent or be stimulated in my everyday life. And it was uh, designed away. So um, I, I think we, as I said, we, I think we need to reconcile it, but um, if I think if we approach every technology from the convenience perspective, there will be nothing much left <laughs> in our world uh, um, that, that is interesting. Because all of these technologies, they need a little bit of attention. So that's already what happens. You have to do a little bit with your coffee machine. I mean, it takes away making the pleasurable things, but still you have to load it, you have to clean it, you have to do all that uh, stuff. So all these technologies add a little bit, but not the, the good parts. So. Um, I was thinking about how can we make things experientially richer, uh, but you know, still preserving something of the automation. I mean, nobody wants to do the dishes now by hand all the time or stuff like that. So we need to find strategies to meet in the middle. And in the design school, you can just, of course, just hand out a project and ask the student to come up with something, and that's what we did, together with uh, Bosch Siemens Hausgeräte. Which, uh, and um, these are just, you know, four strategies we found. The one thing is you can make, um, you can make the work of the machine, of course, more experienceable. So you're, you're not doing the dishes, but it's easier to, you, you get a little bit more involved into the whole process. So they did this dishwasher where you could peep into, peek into it and a special way of showing that it works and you, you could even feel the warmth and so on. So you still, you know, you're still a machine, but you get more involved. You can also have the automation, but mm, designed for a practice. So if you use this kind of kitchen machine, you can't nibble dough, but of course now you can. So the idea is that there are, you know, like little, you can have little holes where you can still do stuff manually while the machine performs. You can turn it around you can start from the manual activity and then automate. 
for example, this magic spoon, which just goes on. And of course, you can develop something like this. Or you can even turn it completely around and you can redesign the manual. If an activity is boring, you can come up with another way of, for example, washing vegetables, which borrows from competence interactions as well. So while all this is not, not, maybe not all is that serious, I don't know whether you want to do your, wash your vegetables like, like this. I tried out, I liked it. Um, and not everything is feasible. I think this shows that there's so many potential strategies you could do in interaction design to spice things up, to find new ways of interactions in between this fully automated and the traditional um, that we should try out more of. of, of. Uh, we have one project where we studied it a little bit because in the coffee project there the grinding came up, uh, the grinding of the beans. So we tried something out. We made a new grinder. Uh, I think it's a, this is a movie. So this is the manual way of doing it. Everybody loves it. But you can already see when he tries it out that it's, it's not so convenient. You need force and it doesn't really work that well. And the coffee powder you get is also not perfect for some machines. And then, of course, you have electrical uh, mills. You just push a button, and it grinds the uh, coffee. And we thought of, why not combining it? So this is actually the same electric grinder, and it has a hand crank, which controls the motor blades, so to say. It's like a, like a pedelec, you know, like a bike with an e-motor. And then we, we, we designed this mill, this grinder, and tried it out in the lab, and asked people to grind beans with a manual grinder, with an electric grinder, and with this electric grinder, which borrows the interaction from the manual. And we measured positive experience, need fulfillment, meaning, all that stuff. And basically, what, what it turns out is that um, this, we call it Hodgson plus, but I don't go into that story, um, that it um, creates, um, although it's an electric mill, it, so to say, imports all the good feelings from the hand mill, and it's sometimes even better because, of course, you feel more powerful, for example. That's like, like with an e-bike or so. You know, feel just, you feel like um, your body uh, feels extended, your strength feels extended. So you can take all this uh, meaning that is in this simple interaction form and just plug it into, onto a machine and suddenly the experience of the machine uh, is much better, much more positive, much more meaningful in that way. Um, and I find that interesting because um, it's quite obvious that, it's a, that this is a, a way to feel in the loop, uh, but um, it challenges this kind of thinking, challenges design in many different ways. So if you think of design, you know, as it, as it was, as it still is, then this idea of form, uh, uh, form follows function means that, there, you know, everybody's looking for some truth, and of course this crank is not needed. It's like an ornament. But still, from an interaction design perspective, it changes the way we interact, and that's um, important. How much time do I have left? Ten minutes, okay. So let me go through another um, uh, project which combines um, both levels I was starting to talk about, the material and the meaning. So I'm very interested in secrets, having secrets, small secrets, not serious secrets, just small secrets. Because psychologically, so there is this need for autonomy and um, to feel autonomous, um, you can have practices of keeping small secrets, especially, you know, when, when children grow up, they start to do that to, to get to distance themselves a little bit from their, from their parents. So when you're, in very, when you're in very close relationships, in very social settings, then it's a strategy to have a little secret to, you know, to remind yourself of being an individual. So this is a practice, and of course it comes with a certain um, interaction. And... Um, Mm, we had a project uh, together with uh, Samsung, and I'd like, like, like to show that first. 
And um, they told me a story. Um, I don't know, I shall actually know whether it's true, but um, in, uh, we've been to South Korea, to Seoul, and they told me that in offices they have, of course they can individualize their, uh, their desks, so typically it's done with pictures, like the, here in the picture frame. But it's not allowed, uh, when you're not married, it's not allowed to have a picture of your partner. So you have to be married. You know, if you're not married, it's your car <laughs> or your house or something, but the moment you're married, you can show uh, uh, your family, so to say. Of course, you want to have maybe this private moment, so we thought of why not putting a secret picture into a, a picture frame to be used in an office. So, so this is a social situation, the office is very controlled, and now and then, you know, you can take a peek at the secret picture and enjoy a moment of um, autonomy. So we came up with the first video prototype there overnight, we did it there in a workshop. And you can already see how we try to match the interaction to the feeling of secrecy that should, uh, sh that should uh, happen uh, through this kind of interaction. So one level is the experience, design, saying keeping secrets is good, and then boiling it down to the office situation, coming up with the uh, technology where you could have this secret. That's the first part. And the second part is uh, designing the interaction. So, um, kind of inspired by this, we talked with people about, like, I think with 10 people altogether, or maybe eight, about um, how they typically consume secrets. And you can find a pattern. So when you consume a secret, it's you, you, you approach slowly, so it's a little bit about unwrapping, unlocking, it takes a little time. Um, this is about anticipation. Of course you want that it goes away quickly, yeah, because you, want to, you don't want to be caught. And it's a lot about tangibility. Yeah, being able to touch the secret and, and to be close to it also bodily. So um, we designed something, uh, a video prototype, and um, um, I will show you the interaction with it. So uh, this is the secret picture, but um, with an interaction that is quite technical. So it's just functional, I'd say. So there's this little remote you see in the uh, left, left side, and you can press a button, quite straightforward. And then there's the secret picture. And if you press again, it's gone. It's functional, you know, picture. Mm. So you could even have designed it with, if I, uh, if I let loose of the button, it, it goes, goes back. And then we did another prototype that took up all the information we had about how to interact with a secret. So functionally, it's the same. You, you reveal a picture, but from the, I would say, from the aesthetics of interaction, it's, it's different. So many people like this better because they say it's, it's also innovative or so. But of course, um, um, the question is whether this, whether this is not only, you know, I, I don't, we don't want to have that just innovative, you know, then you could do every kind of interaction. The question here is, whether this kind of supports the experience of having a secret and consuming a secret. So we used to, we, we showed this video prototype to 300 people and asked them to uh, imagine they would be in that situation, in their office, with their secret picture, and uh, imagine all that, and then we gave them a, a, a series of questionnaires, and one was a, um, a, a privacy scale that measures autonomy feelings and also this kind of contempl uh, contemplation, rejuvenation you get from having this moment for yourself. And you see that people suspect that when they interact with this picture in, the, in this caress mode, like the design mode, that these uh, needs are fulfilled more intensely. 
So this idea that maybe, I mean, it's not built, so we don't know wh how it works in the wild, but at least in this kind of study, uh, people believe or suspect that through a certain way, of, through taking up the general idea of secrecy in the interaction, the whole experience becomes amplified. And that would be something like a general principle I would have about aesthetics of interaction, that interaction should be designed on that level in a way to express you know, the, uh, the feelings you want to uh, achieve on the higher level. So if you design for competence, it's maybe all about you know, big gestures, handholds, control, numbers, uh, fine-grained uh, things. If you design for relatedness, uh, if you, for example, design for long-distance couples that try to feel close over the distance, you need maybe a completely different way of a vague, more ambient way of inter interact, uh, interacting. And through, you know, using the needs and putting them into contact, so to say, uh, with, the, with, with interaction design, um, I think there can be quite an interesting amplifying um, uh, results from that. So let me uh, just add the, I will go through, skip that, but I have a last point to make, say. Um, so all this, you know, if you design these kind of things I just told you, nobody would ever oppose uh, a secret picture in a picture frame in a in an office. So you either like it or you don't like it. Yeah, you will accept it or will not accept it. But it's not causing you any, any problems. But in well-being, there's often the situation um, where it becomes a bit complicated because the things that people do and maybe also like are not necessarily the things that are good for them, whoever you know, is in the situation to determine that. But this research on positive psychology sh shows over and over that people not necessarily adopt the right practices and that we sometimes want them to adopt other practices. So let me show you an example. Let's say um, there is a technology that prevents social contact and exchange. Uh, it alienates you from the natural environment and it leads to constant conflict. So from a well-being perspective, you don't want that. You want to redesign it. And I can redesign that. I can make it into something that fosters sociability, that makes, it, makes you, puts you back into, into the environment, and that turns you into quite a popular person. And I'd like to show you that design, and I've maybe I have to explain, maybe in Turkey, in, in, in Turkey I have to explain it a little bit. In Germany it's quite evident about what it is. So we have these areas in Germany in, 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 in where people live, where, it is, uh, where we have a shared space, so um, everybody, is, everybody can be everywhere, pedestrians and cars, and the cars are supposed to go ma a maximum of seven, uh, seven kilometers per hour, so walking speed. But of course, nobody's doing it. Nobody's doing it. Everybody goes tra there straight, and of course, pedestrians, uh, they just don't use this area. So how would it be, you know, if you could just step out of the car and lead it through this area. It's wonderful, conce conceptually, it's wonderful, because you, you can, t we, we tried it out here, this is an experiment where we tried it out, you know, we, I had a very small research assistant driving the car and the other pretending to be the driver leading it through this, and it's wonderful what happens. You know, the other drivers still respect you as driver, they, they talk with you about, you know. Um, you come into contact with the, with the pedestrians, you talk to them, you're always in the right speed, so conceptually, it's a very nice, uh, nice idea, and it, I think it would be nice, you know, it would be improve life in cities if we would do like that. But then, you know, if you present something like this to BMW, they, they don't find it a very good idea for several reasons. Um, some of them may be real. What if it is raining? And I say, then you don't step out because you only do it in good weather. Um, then people come up with scenarios where it becomes, you know, they become mucked. Like in Munich, I mean, last time you got mucked uh, when you step, 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 stepped out of the car somewhere. Um, it's like, you know, and some have high heels and can't walk and stuff like that. So you have many, many reasons for it. And I think it's a, the reason is why this kind of practice and the technology that conveys it is just not our typical idea of positive 
well-being, it's something different, uh, more long-term oriented. And the whole problem of behavioral change is actually about that. So if you combine it with sustainability, then it's a bit complicated because sustainability is also all, always a little bit outside. So if you, I don't know, if you want to improve the air quality in Istanbul, it will take a while and maybe you will not enjoy it. Uh, it's for the future generations or so, it's very far, far away. But issues like health, for example, they are, they are private and still people don't necessarily adopt the practices which are good for them. Um, and one part of designing for well-being is uh, to come up with strategies for that. And we do that in the, in the, in the environment of, of something we called uh, pleasurable troublemakers, or we call pleasurable troublemakers. Matthias Laschke is working on that. And this is one example, and that's the last thing I want to show you. It's called the key moment. And um, you know, the World Health Organization, they say we, we're not walking enough, we don't get enough exercise, and there's a one basic recommendation. If it's possible, you should take the bike or walk whenever possible. So instead of taking the car all the time, walk, for example, for the commute. And then people go like in Germany, they go like, oh no, my commute is too far away. But then, you know, statistics show that 50% of all the drives are below five kilometers or so. So there is, there is a, there, there needs to, that maybe there's some room to, for improvement, reminding people that sometimes they can use uh, the bike instead. And um, for, the, for the environment and for health, and Matthias did it in a very simple way. So if you take the bike key, it's all fine. But if you take the car key, the bike key drops. And then what people typically do is, of course, they stop, they pick it up, and they think again. But it's all designed in a way that it doesn't get you on your nerves. You know, that's the pleasurable troublemaker idea. So it's exactly designed for that. And there's even ways to cheat. For example, you can take it very slowly and then nothing happens. But of course here the same idea holds. If you do it slowly, you're already re reflected about it. So this is a kind of object. Uh, what is it? What kind of genre of product is it? Uh, it's something to help you along. Um, it's something that reminds you of something. Um, it doesn't pressure, it doesn't force. It's about behavioral change. But I think for me it's a quite a new type of, uh, of product. Um, I wouldn't even have a business model for that. So who's buying something like this? I mean, you can give it, uh, hand it out as a gift maybe or so. Um, we did it as a, a do-it-yourself, so to say do-it-yourself kit. So you can, it's produced for three euros or so, and we hand it out and people try it out. And it's interesting what people do with it and what they experience with it. So we give, typically we give away, we give them away for free, and then they have to be, have to give us an interview. And you know, people develop like a hate love <laughs> with this thing, you know, it's not, of course not totally convenient, sometimes they really hate it. We had a person that said, uh, uh, I was so happy when it broke, uh, but then I fixed it. Uh, because I, I recognize that it helped me along, stuff like that. I think that's a very, in, that, that shows you know, how powerful um, interaction is as a, as a, as a material, you know, because you can shape um, activities and force people into, uh, or lure them into new activities and new ways of interacting. So let me conclude, I will skip that too, let me conclude just some, some some thoughts, and then we can have uh, time, uh, questions, of course. So uh, I think, I hope I showed that uh, technology is not neutral. I mean, if you're in design, you already know that somehow, but I think um, often we have to think um, a little bit on a higher level there, you know, like on the stories that are conveyed through objects, and, we, and, that, and, and these stories are not that often questions. So the whole idea of exercise as medicine it's not very old, like 150 years old maybe. So then suddenly it started like this, that society thought uh, that we need to do sports or something like this. Before it was just hard work and nobody had to do it in a way. And then these stories are perpetuated through 
uh, technology, and that's important. And I think we should make that more explicit. We should talk more about that stories also in design and, and the, the things we imply through certain uh, uh, products. We should write and discuss uh, this narrative. And these narratives also have to be designed. So design is not only about the thing and the interaction and placing buttons, it's about the, uh, the, the, the story you want to con uh, convey. And then if it's about well-being, um, I think well-being and change is very um, closely related. You have many cases where it seems quite, you know, quite obvious how you can improve uh, emotionally a certain situation. But if you dive deeper into this project, it's, there's always trade-offs. So it's always, um, there's always some change involved in that. And, and it's not of, of always so easy to accept by people. So we need more objects that um, anticipate that and help people to transform. So well-being, design for well-being is not having a concept and that's now well-being. Well-being is included. It's more about coming up with ideas how to change practices so that they uh, become better. So if you, for example, know that a family dinner is a nice thing to do, it's not about just pe recommending people you should have a family dinner and leaving them alone, you know, with making that happen, but with designing environments that help them along to actually engage in certain uh, practices. Um, and to do that, I, I think uh, one thing that is really important, especially in the, if you design for change, is that something like humor. I don't know whether uh, getting your keys, you know, when the keys drop in front of you, is, for some people it gets on their nerves, but most of the people I saw using this, they kind of smile because they understand what this thing wants from them and they can't get into this reflective loop. And I think this, the, the concepts we have should be easy uh, in, in that sense and, and should, you know, make you laugh at best, if possible. So thank you for your attention, and I think we have some time for questions. Now.